you were driving into a bus stop? No, no. We're taking you inside that 22-hour standoff. They won't send them out. One frightened woman. Step back a little bit. Standing up against an army of women wearing prairie dresses and identical braided hairdos, singing hymns. And caught in the middle, children with one parent still in and the other one now out, but forbidden contact. Susie, come out and talk to me, okay? Open the door so I can see ya. Parents who were banished because they disagreed with church teachings, now trying to save their children, they say, from a life of forced labor and forced underage marriage. Did you live in fear that the prophet could actually take your family away from you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Tonight, we're getting in to see these three parents get their children out. I want my children now, all of them. All former members. This is human trafficking. In the fight of a lifetime. But only some will be freed. Some will not. All I wanted to do was get the hell out of there. All I wanted to do was just shut that door. FLDS, a house divided. Good evening and welcome to 2020 Saturday. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. As we come on the air tonight, a federal trial continues. And it's a story we've been following for years here on 2020. Our investigation of the FLDS, a house divided. Believers versus defectors of that polygamous sect. Accused of breaking apart families, brainwashing children, against their own mothers. And one of those mothers has now taken the stand, saying that the leader of the FLDS, Warren Jeffs, is still causing destruction, even while locked away for life. Here's Dan Harris and that terrifying standoff, a mother against an entire town. When Sabrina Broadbent comes to pick up her four children, she is returning to what she considers the belly of the beast, the place where the darkest chapter of her life unfolded. There's so many followers out there that follow Warren. They're all for Warren. I just, I don't like it. This is a community known as The Creek, an isolated alternate universe set deep in the desert along the Utah-Arizona border. Here, the women wear prairie dresses, the men, at least the powerful ones, have multiple wives, and the homes have high walls and fences to keep out prying eyes. Sabrina defected from the FLDS back in 2008, and she now lives 200 miles away in Utah. Her children fell into the care of her ex-husband's sister. Her name is Samantha. Last April, Sabrina went to court, seeking and winning full custody. Good boy. I was on cloud nine. All this work up to this point to get my children and everything is just so I could show the judge. I did not abandon my kids. I did not. Later that same day, she, along with her brother and her new husband, drive to Samantha's house in the creek to pick the children up. Did you have any idea that you were driving into a bus saw? No, no, I did not expect any of that. But the ordeal is just beginning. When they arrive, the kids aren't there, so they wait. And just waiting provokes a reaction in the neighborhood. Stay in the van. We'll get it on. Now, I want to get out. Suddenly, more than a dozen vehicles encircle them. The private security force of the church known as the God Squad. Now they're backing up. The God Squad? That's them. Where's the God Squad again? I just got a bad feeling in my gut. I'm like, lock the doors. But you were Yeah, spooked. I just got a bad feeling. It's well past midnight when a car containing Sabrina's children finally slips into the driveway. OK, they showed up at 110. 110 for the record. Oh, they're agreeing. Slam the gate. Sunrise. All right, I'm going to give the sheriff a call. I'm not even kidding. All the trailers are lit up. After spending the night in the van, Sabrina spots her two sons. There's Isaac. Yeah, my cute little son. Is that really? My baby ruined. Well, let's walk up there and they're all going to duck. Mm -hmm. Her two daughters are out of sight. The children are clearly keeping their distance. And when Sabrina goes to talk to her oldest, Isaac, who's 13, it doesn't go well. He has no desire to leave the only world he's ever known. I said, Isaac, come here, let me talk to you. And he's like, get away from me. Get away from me, you apostate. And he jumped the fence and ran. What does it do to you to have your son, your own son, talk to you like that? It was hard. I did not want him to see me cry. I didn't want them to see me weak. Samantha, the children's primary caretaker, seems to be stalling for time. She says, uh, Warren is coming. 
He will deliver these children. He's coming. You think she actually believed that Warren Jeffs was going to break out of a prison yeah. several states away and come and the protect these kids? Yeah. Obey the prophet when he speaks, and you'll be blessed. Disobey him, it is death. Even though he's currently serving life in a prison in Texas for sexually assaulting two underage girls, including a 12-year-old he married, he is said to have ramped up the rigid discipline he demands of his followers. To watch a video, a movie, it is open disobedience. Testing their faith through increasingly strange and seemingly random rules. It's 8 o'clock, 14 hours into the standoff, and church members are coming out of the woodwork. And though they may be forbidden from watching videos from the outside world, they're apparently allowed to shoot their own. There's like a hundred eyes on us right now. Now the reality starts to set in for Sabrina, that custody order notwithstanding, getting her children back will not be easy. They won't, they won't send them out, they won't let me get them. I'll bet you there's at least 15 video cameras and I just about got spit on. They just try to intimidate you. They all had cameras, they'd come right up to your face. They're obnoxious. The creek is not a welcoming place to outsiders. You back off, back off. I have a right to worship any damn thing I want, wear any damn clothes I want. And he turned around as soon as we did, and you know, now he's right on my tail. Drive into this community, and you will almost certainly be tailed by the God Squad, the private church security team that had encircled Sabrina. Just ask you a quick question. Can I just ask you a quick question? No. Can I ask you just a quick question? Guess not. On the rare occasion when you can actually get a church member to speak to you, what you will hear is unvarnished adoration for the imprisoned pedophile prophet. And is that the view of what's happening with uh, the prophet, that it's persecution? Um, in my opinion, yes. Do people feel like he'll, he'll come back? I do. That is exactly how Sabrina Broadbent does not want her children to end up. But in order to get them back, She's going to have to drink from a fire hose of classic FLDS intimidation tactics. Son, if you want to videotape, you just go back a little bit for me, okay? Step back a little bit. This is how they treat people. Yep. This is how they treat people, and they think it's okay. While Sabrina may seem like a hard-charging FLDS antagonist, her story goes much deeper. Not long ago, she was on the other side, a die-hard church member, prairie dress and all. When you grow up, and that's all you know, you know? That's all you know. All right. The wrenching story of how she left without her children when we come back. A House Divided continues. 2006. Let's do it. Right. Joe Broadbent, an FLDS runaway, launches a series of commando-style missions to extract his entire family from the church by any means necessary. I could see him sad, depressed, hurt, scared, and I'm like, why not try and get him out? As seen in a documentary called Sons of Perdition, his most adamant opponent is his oldest sister, Sabrina. Yes, ironically, the same woman who would later find herself on the other side of this conflict was then a zealous defender of the church, here literally pulling on one of her sisters to prevent her from leaving. You want to go? She's not going. You never stop praying and obeying. You never stop keeping sweet. When you grow up, and that's all you know, you know? That's all you know. So you thought Warren Jeffs was God's mouthpiece? Right. The Broadbent family tree is actually quite slender by FLDS standards, Sabrina was raised in a household with one father, just two wives, and 22 children. How old were you when you got married? I was 17. And was it somebody you wanted to marry, you got to pick, or? No, they're just assigned to you. <laughs> Many a young lady gets married thinking her husband should submit to her will. But a woman's duty is to bless her husband. Sabrina knew from the recorded sermons of Warren Jeffs that the job of an FLDS wife is to obey her husband and bear children. And she did her duty delivering two boys and two girls in rapid succession. Her brother Joe had a different duty, working without pay as a manual laborer. 
How old were you when you were first put to work? I was 10 years old. I started driving forklift when I was 12. In fact, I learned how to drive a forklift before a vehicle. So they're brought up working child labor. Sam Brower is a private investigator who's been looking into allegations of FLDS child abuse for more than a decade. Warren Jeffs is, has said if a child wants to play with a doll, give her a baby. If a boy wants to ride a bicycle, give him a shovel. Quit it, my hell. Get out of here. Driving around the creek, we found children at work everywhere with shovels, building fences, running heavy equipment. Brower says his investigations uncovered FLDS organized child labor on an industrial scale at pecan orchards 20 miles away from the creek. The Department of Labor sued the parties involved, including the FLDS church, for nearly $2 million in child labor violations. A hearing is scheduled for this summer. There were literally thousands of children in these orchards. And that's the, the horrible, sad bottom line, that these kids are a commodity and they're used to make money for the church. The schools would stop and we would all load up and go pick pecans. So they would shut down the schools? They would shut down the schools. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, at the age of 17, sick of a lifetime of servitude, Joe escapes the church and heads straight to the devil's playground. I went to Las Vegas. I mean, it was, that was Sin City. It was awesome. Um, absolutely loved it. He finds his new freedom to be a revelation, one he wants to share with the family he's left behind. I could see how the world was to me. You know, I, I wasn't hurt. I wasn't possessed, you know. The people out here are not evil. They're good people. But after that ugly moment we showed you, Sabrina trying to prevent him from rescuing other family members, Joe knows it will take something powerful to shake his older sister's faith. What finally does it is a bombshell dropped by her husband, Jake. He wanted to marry my little sister, and she was 14. Sabrina's husband wanted to marry... Wanted another wife, so... And he wanted to marry one of her little sisters? Mm -hmm. Who was 14? Yeah. Sabrina's husband is banished by Warren Jeffs, not because he wanted to bed his wife's 14-year-old sister, but because only the prophet can decide how many wives a man can have. Sabrina finds herself on the verge of being transferred into another marriage, perhaps with multiple wives. I'm gonna be married off, I'll be the second wife, third wife, fourth wife, and I'm like, I don't wanna be a damn concubine. So she calls Joe and other family members on the outside. They're like, we're coming to help you. You ready? They make a midnight run to a meeting spot in the desert outside the creek. 25-year-old Sabrina jumps into the car and races away to a new life on the outside. At first, freedom is exhilarating. She gets a new haircut. A little like weird. I can't even dress anymore. <laughs> enjoys partying. You all right? But she is also tormented by the fact that her husband's family is insisting on keeping the children. There was nothing I could do at that point because I didn't dare go up against the church or anything. Because the church is so powerful? Yeah. I never dared go up against it. I wanted to. Believe me, I wanted to. I cried myself to sleep many nights, months. I even drink myself to death sometimes. She would scream, she would cry because she missed her kids. She would lose her mind, pretty much. And it was sad to see. Sabrina is now 33, remarried, Smile, geez. with a three-year-old son. That's a good boy. And she has a career as a counselor for troubled youth. She's never lost touch with her first four children still in the church. However, during a scheduled Christmas visitation in 2014, it becomes painfully obvious that her kids view her as an evil outsider. Can I, can I open Isaac? Can you okay. Here, refusing to accept her Christmas presents. Okay. They know that Christmas, gift giving, toys, they all violate FLDS rules and mean a one way ticket to hell. This estrangement becomes one of the big reasons why Sabrina finally musters the courage to fight for custody. 
the court order a sweet vindication of her efforts. There's no tears. There wasn't. I was too happy to cry. And you got right in the car and went to go get them. Yeah, we did. Which brings us back to the standoff. They won't send them out. They won't let me get them. It's now noon. We're 18 hours into this thing. And as the crowd surrounds Sabrina's van with video cameras, it is becoming clearer and clearer to Sabrina that her kids are siding with the faithful. That's Isaac right there, the eldest. And this is Rulin, the younger boy. And here are daughters Sandra and Leticia. Had to lock the doors. Little people are throwing chickens in the van. At one point, the boys even try to put a calf in her van. I'm so sick of this. This is so uncalled for, so unnecessary. What do you think their fear was? Why did they so badly not want to go with you? Because they've been, they've been poisoned against me because I live out here, I'm an apostate. Have they been taught that you're evil? Mm hmm They called me the devil a few times. You're the devil, you know, you're going to hell. About 20 hours into the standoff, Sandra, on behalf of her siblings, delivers a handwritten contract pleading for future trips to the creek. We will only be in this office if you will sign this paper saying that we can have visitation with Samantha. I'm not going to sign anything. It's on my terms. The war for these FLDS children is at a stalemate. But across town, they wouldn't open the gate. Another mother is fighting a similar battle on another front. <sighs> I'm scared. She was once the queen of the FLDS castle. Now she's come back in order to take back her children. I don't want my girls to be raped. I don't want any of my boys to have to sit on the side of their bed and watch their wife get raped. I don't want that. When we come back, her allegations of a new sadistic sex ritual. Plus, is the local government in the pocket of the church? Are you answerable to the public? We go uninvited to the city council for answer. Really, nobody wants to respond to that? Stay with us. Twenty Twenty continues with Dan Harris. What is really going on behind these walls? where the leadership of the FLDS resides. It's just not the same anymore. Charlene Jeffs used to be the queen of this castle, and now she's returning to her old home, wielding information that she says could rock this fortress to its foundations. My youngest daughter right now is 14. That's the age that they like to do things to them. This was just high weeds when I was here. Charlene is perhaps the most provocative new combatant in the civil war over FLDS children. She is trying to get her kids back from none other than Lyle Jeffs, Warren Jeffs' brother and reputed top lieutenant who now resides in this sprawling walled compound. He was always afraid I was going to rock his boat when I'm going to capsize it. <laughs> Charlene was the most senior of Lyle's nine wives, running a polygamous family with 34 children until she was banished into exile nearly four years ago. I was told I, I had complained. I didn't know what I had com complained about, <laughs> but I was told that I had complained. Lyle has no idea that his wife is now on the warpath, trying to get her two youngest children back. I would say to him, Lyle, you have hurt me more deeply than anyone ever has or ever will. And I will never go back to you, and I want my children now, all of them. Oh, no trespassing. So legally, I can be on here, right? He'll find out soon enough, though, because today Charlene is outside posting legal notices demanding a hearing in which she can argue for custody of her two youngest children. And the documents contain explosive allegations detailing her fears for her youngest daughter, Susie. Susie, come out and talk to me, okay? Open the door so I can see you. And I hope that Susie doesn't get involved in the rituals that's going on. The order accuses the church of a profoundly perverse so-called seed bearer ritual in which Warren Jeffs has allegedly decreed that a select group of his 15 most faithful men be assigned to impregnate the women of the FLDS with their husbands required to observe the act. I don't want my girls 
to commit adultery, and I don't want them to be raped. I want all of them out of there. If true, how could this kind of abuse be allowed to take place here in the creek? Because, Charlene argues, the local police are in the pocket of the church. This is a claim that many people here in the creek have made to us, so we go looking for some answers. We can get anybody to talk to us. Curiously, when I show up at the Jeff's compound just days after Charlene's visit, within minutes, the cops mysteriously materialize. Just trying to see if we can talk to Lyle Jeff. Do you work for him? Of course not. The allegation is that the government here basically reports to the church. Uh, not true. Not true? Okay. But this man says otherwise. Helaman Barlow may have long hair and a goatee now, but he used to be the clean-cut chief marshal in the creek. In fact, he once right, swatted our camera. Um, we got, hey, would you mind putting the camera down? Okay. Would you mind putting the camera down? Please. You pushed our camera. Oh, was that you guys with yeah. Flora? You remember that? I did. After quitting the force, he cut a deal and is now cooperating with the United States Justice Department in its ongoing trial in Arizona. So too is Charlene, who was called as a witness this month. Sabrina also gave a deposition. Both of them accused the city governments of using their enforcement authority for the benefit of the FLDS church. Do the police here protect and serve the people or protect and serve the church primarily? My job was to protect the church. Protect the church? Yes. What you're describing is a straight up theocracy. Yes, absolutely. This, this community has always been a theocracy. The former chief spoke to us while surrounded by his wife and friends, all former members. Did you live in fear that the prophet could actually take your family away from you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. With one phone call. Yep. So when you were asked sometimes to do things, is it the case that sometimes you would do things that you found repulsive because you thought, if I don't do this, oh, I'll lose my family? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's actually... A, we wanted yes. to know what city officials had to say about these charges, so we went to City Hall. Hi, my name is Dan Harris. I'm from ABC News. We're looking to see if we can speak to uh, the mayor or the city manager or the chief of the marshals. Uh, nobody's in the office right now, just me. Just you? Okay. Where is everybody? Town meeting, executive session, 6.30. I know what I'm doing tonight. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Harris. I'm from ABC News. The federal government has sued you, saying that you're essentially a wing of the FLDS church. How do you respond to that? Do you have our attorney's phone number? They're saying that you, as an elected body here in the United States of America, are, are effectively the wing of a church, one whose prophet is in prison for two counts of sexual assault of a child. You wouldn't want to respond to that? Our response would be that uh, needs to be from our attorney. We were struck by how many of the council members share the same last names, a sign of how closely related everyone is here in the creek. Is anybody here not a member of the FLDS? So you're all members of FLDS, right? Seriously, nobody will answer the question? Three minutes is out. Thank you. The city's lawyer tells us the council is not controlled by the church. However, Charlene Jeffs, a believer turned apostate, fully expects discrimination when she arrives at the local marshal's office to ask for help would like to have permission to check on my children. She has the right to conduct what's called a welfare check with her two youngest kids, but she doubts the local cops will assist the lowly wife taking on the bishop. Okay, I'd be happy to help you out. There we go. Oh, there we go. To her surprise, the marshals allow her and her lawyer inside and produce her 17-year-old son, Amon, and 13-year-old daughter, Susie. Susie tried to fight on a hug, and I know it's just because of the teachings and Ammon just did a handshake but Ammon smiled and I felt like it was a more sincere smile I know that they love me they're just confused for the moment she's reassured that her kids are okay but then late that night under cover of darkness our cameras capture three large trailers easing out of the prophet's compound destination unknown no license plate. 
Could her kids be in those trailers? Could Charlene have just lost her last chance to get her kids back? I'm scared. I'm scared of what Lyle will do. I know that he will put the children in hiding so that I will never have any kind of contact with him again. When we come back... I'm gonna guess there's, what, 25 vehicles right here? Sabrina Brockett facing drastic measures to end a standoff now in its 20th hour. They're trying to figure this out with the judge. I'm gonna give them permission to get my children and put them in the van. Will she finally get her kids back or leave empty-handed and broken-hearted when a house divided returns? Twenty continues with a house divided. It's 20 hours into Sabrina Broadbent's standoff with the FLDS. She still doesn't have her children back, and she's finally had enough. They are waiting for me to give the to go. They we got a pickup order. She's called in law enforcement. The county sheriffs who are not accused of being beholden to the church. And now she tells them it's time to use force if necessary to end this thing. Now what's going on with the cops? They're talking on the phone. What's going on? They're trying to figure this out with the judge. So oh, okay. Get this protection order or this uh, pickup order. I'm going to give them permission to get my children and put them in the van. So here it goes. I'm sick of this. As if on cue, the FLDS women react. I started seeing them bring their suitcases out. I'm like, okay, here we go, here we go. 50 people trying to help the kids out. And the cop, one of the deputies went up and says, this is your last chance. We'll be down the road. Finally, escorted by their FLDS keepers, the children walk towards Sabrina's van, crying. That's her older boy, Isaac, there covering his face. It seems like things might be looking up for Sabrina and her family. But wait, out of the blue, the tide turns. Scores of church members descend upon the mouth of the van. It's a sea of prairie dresses and updos. They're like, we're not forcing the children. They have to do it on their own. But they're so brainwashed, they wouldn't even step in the van. Sabrina's brother, Joe, who's gotten so many of his family members out of the church, was right there. They're saying, you're, you know, you're, go you're leaving with the devil. People in the crowd are weeping, praying, they begin singing an FLDS hymn. These people have no questions about their prophet, even though he's in prison for sexual oh, abuse. Well, that's a big test for him. He's like, the only way that I'm not out is because you're not faithful enough. He puts so much pressure on the people. They're fasting, you know, they, they don't eat for three days at a time. And they, they pray and pray and pray for Warren to break out of prison. For a moment, Sabrina wavers. We were going on two hours of sleep. I, I couldn't eat. They're like, well, we can come back tomorrow. I'm like, no, we're doing this today. This is happening today. The sheriffs are slow to act here because they say they're worried this tense scene could explode into mob violence. But finally, a sheriff's deputy pokes his head around the corner of the van and says, time to go. At long last, the kids get in. The van pulls away with the followers of Warren Jeffs waving and weeping. The arduous extraction of Sabrina's children is an inspiration to other ex-FLDS members like Ron Robach. Ron was banished from the church in 2002, and all of his seven wives and 50 children were reassigned to another man, including his then four-year-old daughter, Sherilyn, pictured here with Warren Jeffs. Then one day, a strange call from the FBI puts him in the middle of his own harrowing custody dispute. A tipster had directed the agents to this trailer where Sherilyn was being housed in shocking conditions. She didn't have running water to the trailer. They brought her food once a week in a box this big. 
And then she had one other number that she had to call every 15 minutes. The brainwashing was so constant. And this was punishment from the family with whom she was living at the time. Exactly. The FBI has taken Sherilyn into custody. You just know that they're thinking about you. Now Ron and his new wife, Jerry, decide to bring his daughter into their home. She was a little distant, but it was it was very short period of time before she had both arms through my arms. On the advice of a lawyer, the Robox and Sherilyn leave the creek and go into hiding. A secret seven day road trip to California to buy some time for a judge to grant the Robox legal custody. We got down to Santa Monica and we got a room and we walked over to Bubba Gump's. You can see in the picture, she was smiling. She, she, she was lit having up. fun. She had been taught since birth that the outside world was evil. Oh, and yeah. here you were demonstrating. It wasn't, it was fun. For the Robox, these first baby steps toward a new family life for Sherilyn seem to be going well. And for Charlene Jeffs, a surprise phone call of her own. My husband called me and said, hey, let's, let's settle this out of court. Her husband, Lyle Jeffs, agrees to a secret meeting and reluctantly gives up custody. We're here to file custody papers so that I can get my two underage children. The judge orders the handoff that day. Charlene invites us to document the transfer from a distance with a sheriff, a marshal, and church security right there to make sure it all goes smoothly. The kids refuse to get out of the white car they're in, but they do agree to follow their mom to their new home outside of the creek. It was a hope. It was a risk in losing them all together. I had to just rely on faith and prayers. So here we are, Charlene Jeffs, FLDS royalty breaking free, Sabrina Broadbent through sheer determination, and Ron Robach all now reunited with their children. But will it last? The truck door opened up and they grabbed her and pulled her in and she was gone. I'm scared. It was a nightmare when we got home. What do you mean? Can she turn this ordeal into a happy ending? when we come back. We return to 2020. After a 22 hour standoff, Sabrina Broadbent departs the creek with her children, enjoying a moment of personal triumph. All I wanted to do was get the hell out of there. That's all I wanted to do. But it's only a moment. As soon as they drive away from the standoff, and head up Highway 59 through the Red Rock mesas and mountains to her home in southern Utah, the road gets rocky. How were the kids when they got in the van? They were all crying, and my youngest was pulling my hair and throwing things at my head and stuff. But I went back there and just nuzzled up to them and looked at them like they were my friends. Like, here I am. How did they react to that? After about a half an hour, they all fell asleep. But it was a nightmare when we got home. What do you mean? My oldest took a magic marker to my 60 inch screen TV that we just got and cut all the cords to the TV, to the dish. These kids were raised in a world where they were told that the outside is evil. And here you come pulling them into the outside. Right. At what point they, they packed up their stuff? They did. And they sat on my front lawn with all their blankets. And their suitcases? With their suitcases and cried. It was dang hard for, to me to see that. I got it. <laughs> Undaunted, Sabrina is determined to reconnect. Hey, okay, Hillary. Up. Oh. And catch up on lost time with her kids far away from the FLDS. Pull. Oh. <laughs> so she is filling their days with the kind of fun the prophet Warren Jeffs would never allow skeet shooting, hiking, fishing, and four wheeling. Rue, did you go out and drive this? I'm getting it. You're getting Oh, good. They've come alive the last couple of days. We've been going out and doing activities with them and involving them and stuff, and they love it. Aided and abetted by the purchase of a new puppy, and of course, by lots of maternal patience and love, Sabrina's children seem to be coming around. I only have to do the automatic ones. So here we are a couple weeks later. Mm -hmm. How are they doing now? They're doing great. Last night was the first time they watched TV. Ever? First time in their life. 
I don't know so, if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, it's it's the it's good stuff. It's like the old Disney movies, like Herbie and Apple Dumpling Gang. It's like they're catching up. Yeah. On childhood. To ease the transition, Sabrina is letting the girls wear their prairie dresses until they decide to change on their own. And I'm not going to force them to do anything like their hair, the way they comb their hair, their dresses. You know what? Everything is happening so fast. On another highway, crossing a different desert, Ron and Jerry Robach head home to the creek after five seemingly happy days in California with Ron's daughter. But Ron and Jerry notice something odd in Sherilyn's behavior. She was writing in shorthand. Indecipherable scribbles in a kind of cryptic journal. And as they approach the Nevada border town of Mesquite, she said, oh, we're not stopping in Mesquite? Why was she so concerned about not stopping in Mesquite? So at Sherilyn's insistence, they pull off the freeway and drive into this parking lot. Sherilyn's sitting in the vehicle. She didn't want to get out. So I walked around to the, her side of the car. And at that very minute, the truck pulls up. She jumps out. of. They grab her. She's in the truck. And they're gone. I mean, it happened like clockwork. The robots say they have no doubt that Sherilyn somehow tipped off the FLDS and helped set up this brazen snatchback. So where is your daughter now? I have no idea. My personal beliefs is she's right over here in Lyle's complex. I helped build that property. You know how many secret hiding places there are in that place? They've got caverns and thin caverns in there. The resistance and the resources of the remaining FLDS hardcore membership raises some disturbing questions. Could they resort to violence as the leadership of this outlaw church loses its grip? The people who are left following him are following a madman who I don't believe has any hesitation at all in leading these people out in a blaze of glory. And that's what worries me, is that there may be another Jonestown or another Waco. Ron Robach, who says he lost a golden opportunity